Well, welcome to uh, Nararika Village Sustainable Building Design and Practice and Village Building Standards and Village Energy Systems. We've got a lot on. I'm Jeff Cameron. Uh, I've been involved in Narara Eco Village for many years now. Um, I've recently finished building my house in the village, uh, my Hempcrete Sustainable Building. Um, and I have an official title, which is head of the water and sewer utility. Uh, we do have our own private utility in the village. And I've also been heavily involved in our own electricity utility in the village as well. So Narara Eco Village, we have a vision and uh, researching, designing and building ecologically and economically sustainable community. Um, that's the heart of what we are trying to achieve. We're a demonstration eco village. Um, and this presentation tonight is part of our outreach uh, to the wider community. Uh, our village that we're building, we've actually broken it up into stages. Stage one, um, which is the first 60 lots comprising 42 standard lots and 18 cluster houses. Um, we've created that subdivision uh, by building the roads, the bridges, the infrastructure, the water uh, pipes in the ground and sewer, um, the power systems have all been constructed. And those 42 standard lots, well, house construction is well underway now. Um, about half are either complete or underway. The 18 cluster dwelling should be complete in uh, within about two months now. Um, and we have lodged a DA for stage two of the project, which is another 44 standard lots and eight larger lots, which we hope in future to be able to use for co-housing uh, style development. So we've started building our, our own houses within the village. And the first question that we had to answer was, um, how do we build sustainable buildings? And the obvious question, uh, what is a sustainable building anyway? Um, and we spent a lot of time thinking about this and come up with some principles. Um, a building would need to have a very low carbon footprint when it's constructed, uh, low energy requirements for the occupants to live in it. Um, the building would need to have a long design life, so it's not gonna fall apart in 20 years and have to be rebuilt. Um, at the end of its life, the material should be readily recycled, reused. Um, the environment inside the building should be healthy for the people who live there. The design of the building should be adaptable. If it's going to be there for multiple generations, it has to be able to um, cater for those changing needs, including um, aging in place. So how do, you, uh, how do you build a building out of low carbon footprint materials? Well, these days there's lots of choice. Um, high fly ash concrete is readily available. Um, straw bale and straw panel, hempcrete, rammed earth, mud brick, earth bag, cob, which is basically gravel in clay uh, for an internal wall uh, held in by wire mesh. Um, timber from you know, sustainably sourced timber and any material that's been recycled from previous use. They are all low carbon footprint materials and we have examples of all of those already in our village. Um, what sort of materials, uh, sorry, the low energy requirements for occupants living in the house? Well, photovoltaic panels on the roof and batteries are an obvious and readily available way to reduce your footprint. Um, passive solar design of the house itself is very important. We'll talk about that. Um, window blinds, which are tight fitting or indoor curtains. Uh, window awnings, um, which can either be fixed or operable um, to keep summer sun out. Summer sun out. Uh, draft ceiling, very important. Um, efficient appliances, uh, stay ratings, uh, very useful these days. Um, heat pump hot water system is highly efficient, uh, or solar hot water. Uh, ceiling fans, uh, very efficient cooling, and two-way to circulate the warm air in winter. Air conditioning um, is an efficient way for winter heating, and lead lights are you know, standard these days, which are low energy. So, what is passive solar design for uh, for houses? Um, the house is designed to allow winter sun in and keep summer sun out. 
Um, and for that to work properly, you need thermal mass, um, which will stabilize the temperature. It could be concrete slab, it can be thermal mass in walls. Um, there's even um, simulated thermal mass these days, phase change material. Um, and in order for the winter sun to come in, you need glass facing north. Um, and to keep the summer sun out, you need to design your eaves in relation to the glassed area on the north side and minimize um, windows east and west. And you'll also see at the top of this particular design, uh, there are clustery windows. Um, and they are very important in letting warm air out in summer. Um, on a summer's evening, even if there's no breeze, you can open uh, windows and doors at ground level and your clustery windows, and the warm air will take itself out due to the difference in density between cool and warm air. You don't need a breeze. So that's a very efficient house design. Um, it requires then very little artificial heating and cooling to keep it comfortable all year round. This uh, is the design of the house I've just finished building in the Eco Village. And this is a passive solar design, as you can see, uh, north is to the left and the uh, left hand wall is exactly north facing. So that big roof you're looking at um, is exactly facing north as well and pitched up at 20 degrees. Um, and that's been designed for solar panels. And you can see the architect has uh, shown the penetration of sun in summer and winter into the house. It's sitting on a concrete slab which is connected to the ground for thermal mass and stable temperature and you can see there are clustery windows which in this case are facing south because in our environment in the village we didn't need any more passive solar heating so south was the best direction for those. And speaking of uh, pitching up the roof for photovoltaic uh, panels um, it's not clear exactly what angle, uh, or not obvious at least, what angle is best. Um, uh, the top left corner here on the left um, is a flat roof, uh, and that's pretty ideal for collecting summer sun because the sun actually rises slightly south of overhead and moves to the north during the middle of the day and then back to south as it sets. Um, so that would give you maximum production in summer. The problem is it would uh, significantly reduce your production in winter when, and in addition, the days are shorter in winter. So that would be uh, a panel that's heavily skewed to summer production and uh, you'd be very short of power in winter. On the other hand, the top uh, right hand illustration is a panel that's til tilted up, you know, around 30 degrees, which is ideal for winter midday sun, uh, but not so ideal for summer. Um, and at the bottom is a, a good compromise, um, which is about 20 degrees um, or even up to 25 degrees. Village building standards. So as part of our research, before we started building our houses, we put together um, a list of requirements. So each house in the village must have um, minimum requirements and then must achieve a score on a score sheet. Uh, on, on a much broader, broader list of categories. So mandatory items include uh, a maximum floor area, uh, reduced water consumption, uh, recycled water to toilet and garden, uh, a minimum of seven star thermal efficiency, and to consume less energy than is generated by the PV system sitting on the top of the house. So they're mandatory on all houses in the village. But in addition to that, there's a spreadsheet where you need to achieve 70 points for things like rainwater tanks, uh, grey, grey water systems, energy efficient appliances, energy efficient lighting, low carbon footprint materials, recycled materials, low VOC for, for healthy environment, low transport miles for the materials in the house, end of life, adaptability of design, and uh, waste planning and management um, during construction and during occupation. So it's a fairly extensive list of things you need to consider um, before you're allowed to build your house. And also you need to consult with your neighbours um, and get a signed agreement with all of your neighbours that they're happy with the design and the shadowing um, from your design. And then finally we have the energy village systems where the village itself, the eco village, um, is the developer who has constructed all of the electricity network throughout the village. Um, all the power cables are buried. 
Um, but the Ecovillage is also the network operator. So Osprey stops at the gate for the entire village and the village itself runs the network. The village is also the energy retailer. We issue ourselves with our own electricity bill each quarter. Um, we also are the water utility. So we issue ourselves with our own water utility bills. Each house in the village has to be a net exporter of power. In other words, the PV panels on the roof must cover the annual consumption. And as a consequence of that, we expect the entire village will be a net exporter once all the houses are built. And in order to get, make all of this work, we've designed a smart grid for the village with central control and a century bat central battery system, which, which we believe will be quite large, about half a million dollars. And we have gone to market for expressions of interest on that system now and are evaluating the responses. And uh, the federal arena uh, funding uh, body has come to uh, the party with a $1 million grant to assist us in establishing, designing, operating, and then reporting to them on that smart grid that we're putting together. So each home um, is, is designed so that this it can be part of the smart grid um, and it starts with a smart meter um, which allows us to monitor to actual time of use and allows the homeowner to monitor time of use uh, electricity data production on the roof and consumption by individual appliances um, and houses uh, rec uh, you know, uh, our guidelines uh, include designing for recharging electric car which could be an important source of battery storage for the house and for the grid. A home management system to communicate between the owner and the appliances and the electricity systems. And then uh, in the top right hand corner we have a cloud server which allows both the smart grid and the homeowner to monitor in real time and also historic data uh, on the operation of each house. And one of the issues we have in running a smart grid is uh, with PV on the roof of every house and community buildings, um, we're producing an awful lot of our power during the middle of the day. And unfortunately, most of the demands are either early in the morning and in particular during the evening peak when people come home, turn on the lights, the television, cook their dinner, um, turn on entertainment. Um, and in we need to, as part of the smart grid, match the production with the consumption. And a couple of approaches to that are to firstly uh, store the energy in batteries, which is produced during the day, so we can use it during the morning and evening peak. But secondly, to try and shift the demand um, so that the smart grid can ensure that the water heating is done during the middle of the day, and even air conditioning in summer um, can be arranged so that it happens during the day so that the house is pre-cooled or in winter, so the house is pre-warmed um, when the occupants get home. So that's part of the, um, the issues we have in designing and operating the smart grid throughout the village. And as part of our agreement with ARENA, we've, we have promised that we will uh, install 275 kilowatts of photovoltaic panels on homes, another 196 kilowatt of community PV on facilities, 460 kilowatt hours of battery storage in the centre of the village um, or distributed through houses and a smart grid control system to manage appliances, production and batteries and then share the information in real time with the wider community through our websites um, on how our smart grid is operating. And some of the dilemmas we've had to work our way through in designing and operating the smart grid is uh, firstly, whether we start with an AC or a DC grid or both, um, because there certainly there are energy losses in uh, going from a, uh, a PV panel, which runs in DC, um, to the household appliances, which are AC, um, uh, to a central battery, which might be at the other end of the uh, village grid and the village grid is AC, then the battery would be DC, and then to come and bring it back to the house, you've got to reconvert. There's significant losses in all of that. Um, and whether we uh, centralise all the batteries in the centre of the village or uh, distribute them on individual ha houses or, or precincts, um, and what is the most efficient way to run that? 
And whether within individual houses we're happy with single phase wiring or we recommend three phase, for example, for fast charging of cars or for photovoltaic systems on the roof greater than 10 um, kilowatts, which also requires three phase. And do we give homeowners, uh, do homeowners give the community, i.e. the smart grid, the right to switch their appliances on and off when it suits the smart grid uh, and not necessarily when it suits them? Uh, that's an interesting social issue. Um, and do we allow individual homeowners to go completely off grid from our grid um, if they so choose? Another interesting social issue. So these are the joys of designing and living in a eco-village. Thank you.